Pete Gordon. Uh, I'm an American independent filmmaker, directed a bunch of movies, wrote a bunch of movies, produced a bunch of movies. Uh, mostly in the last 10 years, I've been working a lot in television in the States. Uh, I started as an actor in the 80s and 90s. But before all of that, and what led me to all of that was growing up, and still now, I was an immense film buff. Uh, love movies, love going to movies. I spent way too much of my adolescence in dark movie theaters at revival houses, watching films back on film when they were still on film. Uh, going to see every new movie that opened that sounded at all interesting. Uh, and look, to this day, here we are, you know, in the age of Blu-ray, and I have my huge collection, and uh, I'm a huge fan of Indicator, which is why I was glad to do this for them, because they're bringing back a lot of films that I grew up loving that have kind of gotten lost. And when Chris from Indicator um, said to me, would you want to do an intro or something, and they sent me a list of films that they had coming up, I immediately centered on Blue Collar, because it, it's a film that I deeply, deeply love and had a tremendous influence on me as a filmmaker, but also as a human being. And I think those are the really important films in our lives, and we, we, we all sort of have them, those movies that transcend just, oh, that's a really good movie, to that's changing the way I perceive the world around me. Um, and Blue Collar was one of those movies for me, and it's a movie that has gotten painfully forgotten, especially painful because, at least right now in America, it's an incredibly important film. I mean, it's probably the best American political film of the last 50 years. It, it's certainly the most important American political film of the last 50 years in terms of its content. Um, but perhaps why it didn't sort of survive and make a lot of money and be known by a modern audience as well is the very thing that makes it so important, which is a very angry film. It's a very radical film. It's a, it's a Marxist film. It's, you know, we make a lot of movies in America that are, are uh, political, but they tend to be soft, they tend to be liberal, they tend to be anti-war films, and I've made an anti-war film, or anti-racism film. They're not stances that are dangerous or hard to take. Uh, we have documentaries that are much more politically edgy, uh, and we'll do satire, you know, we'll do Network or Dr. Strangelove, but, but flat out statement angry political films have not been part of the mainstream US uh, film dialogue. Uh, you guys in the UK have it much more. You people like Ken Loach or whatever actually who do traffic in that, but we, we don't. Um, so it was a very unusual film in that sense, and I think it's part of why it struggled. Um, but it's a remarkable, remarkable movie. I mean, it, it postulates that the reason American capitalism can succeed is that those at the top are very successful at pitting those at the bottom against each other. And that the way you stay in power is that you take the black and put them against the white. You take men and put them against women. You take the old and put them against young. Uh, and that's so much what my country is going through right now in the age of Trump. Uh, you know, where now it's become immigrants, now it's become... But that kind of angry hatred of each other, which is fostered and fed by those in power because it's very convenient. If, as long as the working classes are fighting each other, they're not fighting you. Uh, and this film doesn't just say that metaphorically, it doesn't hint at it, it flat out makes that statement. It says it in words. And that's a very unusual and very powerful thing. And I remember at age 17 when the film was released uh, in 1978, uh, that that got me thinking about the world in a way I wasn't used to. And it got me thinking about politics and the role of workers and the role of owners in a way that I hadn't thought of before. Uh, and it has echoed with me ever since. And it's become part of how I see the sicknesses in how we create wealth. Um, this started me down that road of thinking, and that's a big change for a film to make in your soul. Um, another place where the film had a tremendous impact on me was in the area of music. Um, you know, occasionally movies will change your taste in other areas, and I always think that that's a really cool thing that movies can do. Um, I had never had an interest in classical music until uh, Kubrick in uh, Clockwork Orange and in 2001 played with classical music in ways that made me go, oh, that's really interesting. And, you know, hearing uh, Walter then, now Wendy Carlos's electronic versions of Beethoven was like, wow, that's amazing. And so then I started listening to uh, Carlos's music and that, and, and uh, he, he, now she, uh, did a lot of work with Bach and, and, and then I found, I was listening to the originals and it sort of changed my taste forever. Well, Blue Collar did that to me with the blues. Um, you know, I was a white middle class boy. I didn't, I didn't really know the blues. And uh, I remember sitting in the theater and Jack Nietzsche's incredible opening title music comes on and it runs through the whole movie. And it's one of the great pieces of movie music of all time. I mean, just the music alone 
sets a world in a way that very, very, very rarely does music do in a film. And it's very rare to hear that kind of angry, edgy music in a film, uh, certainly in an American film. And by the time that opening credit sequence was over, I was like, okay, I want more of this music in my life. So I went and got the soundtrack and then I started buying Muddy Water records and Highland Wolf records and Robert Johnson records. And you know, it, it became a part of my whole taste and vocabulary about music in the world. And again, it's rare, but wonderful. One, one piece of art can turn you on to a whole other area of art. And this film did that for me. And it's been part of me ever since. One of the things that's so remarkable about the film is that it's not a film that starts as an angry political movie. And that's part of why its anger is so effective in the end, is that Schrader does a very brilliant thing in making you feel at ease, making you feel at home, making you feel it's gonna be okay. Uh, the film starts with a relationship between two black workers and a white worker that's actually quite ideal. I mean, they seem to look past race, they seem to be really close and really open with each other. Uh, the work seems tough and difficult, but you know, but basically there's a lot of humor in it. I mean, Richard Pryor's very funny and the film kind of goes along and just like the characters, you're not aware of how dark things are getting until you're in it. Uh, and that makes the second half of the film, when things go from this lighter world to a very, very, very dark world and a very dangerous world, very powerful and very unsettling and very uh, like being caught in a nightmare. And all these characters are caught in a nightmare and it's changing who they are. It's not just what's happening to them exterior, but it's what's happening to their interiors as human beings. That's a very, very tricky thing to pull off, but the film does it brilliantly. You're not, it doesn't have loose ends sticking out. A lot of films that I think try to work with that kind of change of tone struggle because you become aware of what's happening. It's the movie's changing on me. Schrader somehow does it just so beautifully that you're not aware you're, you're in a different movie until you're in that movie. Uh, and that really hinges to a large extent on the incredible performance that he got from Richard Pryor. And it's sort of important to remember that Pryor at this point hadn't been seen as a dramatic actor. He was a guy who had done comedies very, very, very successfully. Uh, and certainly his stand-up work had a lot of pain and rage and anger. But nobody had really tapped into that and put it into a fictional setting and into a character. And, and, it, and it was a pretty ballsy move on Trader's part to get this guy who had never gone those kind of places on screen and go, I trust that you can go there. And he got this incredible performance and Pryor really becomes the voice of the tone of the film because he starts funny and light and playful and then by the end of it, boy, it's gone places that rip your heart out and, and uh, are frightful and disturbing and sad. Um, it's also, you know, the best work and best role that Yafet Koto ever had in a film. I mean, a brilliant actor, but just who never got his due and never got those kind of parts. And it also represented a chance for Harvey Keitel to go back to a kind of empathetic and naturalistic and vulnerable kind of character that he'd started with, but kind of got away from. He became more and more caricature and played things in a very wild roles, which was he's great at. But it's easy to forget that when he started in the early Scorsese films, he was sort of the voice of an everyman. And, and this film allowed him to go back to that. And he has a very unusual combination because he definitely feels like a real working class street guy in the film, but there's a vulnerability to him that lets you in. And that's a hard thing to get to in terms of that balance. What's interesting is that as great as these performances are and all that, you know, Schrader, when he talks about the film, talks about how all three actors despised each other and it got worse and worse as the film went along, and they also hated him. Uh, and there's a story that he tells about how it got to the point where Pryor actually pulled a gun on him and said he wasn't gonna do more than three takes of the scene. So somehow, Schrader was juggling this, juggling making this film on a very limited budget, a very limited time schedule, um, and holding off the studio, who was busy freaking out at the end of the movie and going, you can't end where, you're, where the film does end, which I won't discuss for those who haven't seen it, but. Um, so, and here he was doing all that, and this was his first movie. I mean, that, that would be an insane amount to take on on your fifth movie, but he was doing it having never directed before. Now, certainly he knew film inside out, and he had written Taxi Driver, and he was already an incredibly influential figure, but it's one thing to write great film, it's another thing to be on a set with people of huge egos and studio people and dealing with all the, the things you have to deal with. And then to create a film that only reflects the best of that. 
uh, that's a very rare and special thing. And, you know, it has a, an incredibly rich texture, which is also not something you see in American mainstream movies. The, the, the tactileness of the film, from that opening credit sequence through the film, you, you, you smell the ozone in the air in that car factory. You, 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 know, you, you, you know what places feel like. The art direction's beautiful. I mean, just if you look at the posters on walls, places, whatever, it's like everything's creating a, a very real and, and difficult world to, to live in. It's funny, you know, there's, there's like a list of like great debut films, and to me this belongs on it, um, you know, and obviously the one that everybody knows and everybody talks about is Citizen Kane, which is at the top of that list, but to me this is, if not at the level of Citizen Kane, it's on that list, it's on that list of sort of how the hell did this person do this uh, debuts, and to me, if you can be on a list with Citizen Kane, <laughs> you've accomplished something very special. I look, if there's anything seriously wrong with the movie, it's that no one has seen it. That's really the biggest flaw of Blue Collar is that it came out, it got these tremendously good reviews, uh, but it basically played a bunch of the major cities and, and found a sm small dedicated audience, but it never found a big audience. And then it's gotten sort of forgotten in the sands of time. And it's part of why I'm so really grateful that Indicator is bringing it back out because it's a great, great movie and it's been hard to see. Um, it does strike me as not a little ironic and sad that it's a UK company that's putting out this film that's so much about America's sickness, although I'm sure you guys share some of the same problems. But it's, you know, it does say something, and I don't think it's just completely coincidental that it's not, there's not a US company taking this film and saying, hey, everybody, uh, look at what's going on around you and look at this movie because this is, our society's in deep trouble and we're ripping out each other's throats and we should be aiming our anger at the people at the top of the heat and we're not. I think if you're watching it again for the first time in a long time, you'll find what I find every time I go back to it, which is that it only feels more important, less dated, and more of the moment with every year that goes by. And that's something very rare and very special. Mm -hmm.